This time on episode 302 of Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., we discuss Runaways Season 2, Episode 12, Earth Angel, and Season 2, Episode 13, Split Up, and Weekly Marvel News. I'm Josh Liston from On the Bubble Podcast, an oral history of television fandom, part of the Gunner Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other awesome geeky shows at gunnageeknetwork.com. You have been granted clearance by director Alfonso Mac McKenzie. Stand by for a shield debriefing. All information to be discussed here is classified and may only be discussed among agents granted clearance by the S.H.I.E.L.D. director. Now it's time for your scheduled debriefing. I'm Director SP. And I'm Agent Michelle. Welcome to Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. We're a Marvel Comic Universe fan show. The show is recorded on Sunday, September 29, 2019, live from the Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. studios and broadcast galactic-wide via www.geeks.live. You can come and join our live chat and talk with us as we record. Michelle, happy National Coffee Day. I enjoy coffee. I had some this morning. I, I can only really do coffee in the morning. I'm not a throughout the day coffee person. I can't do the full leaded coffee anymore. I mean, I can every once in a while, but usually it's either decaf or half calf and I can have it throughout the day metered. But if I have that just one huge shot in the morning, I just go off the handle for about an hour, then I have to sleep. Okay. <laughs> also, just the caffeine just does some nasty stuff to my system, but I do like coffee. So I've got some decaf right here in the cup as we record as usual. So I am celebrating National Coffee Day. It's only National Coffee Day. It's not International Coffee Day. So I don't know what the rest of the world does on this day. Go about their business. <laughs> Maybe they have a cup of coffee anyway. Perhaps. Okay. Well, let's get on with the show. Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is a fan-based podcast on the ABC television show Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., the multiple Marvel small screen series, as we will discuss today, and the Marvel cinematic and comic book universes in general. Because of overzealous proposals. If you'd like to talk to us about your betrothed, you can catch us on our website, legendsofshield.com. You can leave us a voicemail, 844 the bus one. That's 844-843-2871. If you want to talk to the ladies about the love of your life who you just met, you can get them on our Facebook page, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. You can leave a comment on our YouTube videos at youtube.com slash gonna geek and tell us about your betrothed. You can tell your Amazon device to enable Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. skill. Or you can join our Discord server chat at guineageek.com slash Discord and talk about having a relationship with the mother of the person that you are patrolled to. And remember, Legends of Shield is a proud member of the guineageek.com network. So Michelle and I are going it alone this week. Both Lauren and Haley wanted to be here for the end of season two of The Runaways. But they couldn't make it, so they said, go ahead, record, and we'll join you next week as you start Cloak and Dagger. That's pretty much how it went, right, Michelle? Pretty much. Okay. So with that, we're going to get on with our main event, talking about the Runaways. Runaway Season 2 was slipped on Hulu December 21st, 2018, all 13 episodes, and we are talking about episode 12 and 13 today. Episode 12 was titled Earth Angel. It was directed by Steven Surgic. He has 60 directing credits starting in 1985, including Wayne's World 2, one episode of The X-Files, 10 episodes of Da Vinci's Inquest, two episodes of Monk, that was on HBO if I remember correctly. Three episodes of Flashpoint, one episode of Eureka on Sci-Fi, seven episodes of Psych, which I think was a USA uh, show, six episodes of Warehouse 13, ten episodes of one of my heartiest 
uh, shows called Burn Notice. Seven episodes of something that Michelle and I watched to the end, Person of Interest. Uh, one episode of The Defenders, one episode of The Punisher, two episodes of Luke Cage, four episodes of Daredevil, all on Netflix still. One episode of Runaways, that would be this episode. Three episodes of The Gifted, which is now canceled. Three episodes of Jessica Jones and three episodes of Have You Seen This? Lost in Space, Michelle? Nope. It is awesome. It's uh, on Prime, I believe. I thought it was Netflix. Okay, it's on Netflix. I watched it like you know, over the winter when it was like cold out and had nothing better to do. It was really good. I enjoyed it. So I, I heartily recommend it. Anyway. This episode of Earth Angel was also written by Warren Hugh Leonard, and he has five writing credits starting in 2013, two episodes of Perception, four episodes of How to Get Away with Murder, one episode of Power, three episodes of Runaways, and one episode of Looking for Alaska. Michelle, what was the creative team besides the final episode of the season, Split Up? Split Up was directed by Jeremy Webb who has 33 directing credits starting in 1997, including four of Grange Hill, nine Casualty, three True Dare Kiss, two episodes of Doctor Who, 15 episodes of Merlin, a show I actually enjoyed, two episodes of Silk, two Downton Abbey, two Atlantis, five episodes of Masters of Sex, two Elementary, one Fear the Walking Dead, seven episodes of Turn, Washington Spies, one Legion, two Runaways, three episodes of the punisher two of the umbrella academy and two altered carbon this episode was written by quinton peoples has 17 writing credits starting in 1993 including three episodes of flash forward one of the last ship four unforgettable two iron fist one in humans which you are forgiven for and four episodes of runaways and the runaways are based on the marvel comics by brian k vaughn and adrian alfano and there are some really good shows between Jeremy Webb and Quentin Peoples that you were talking about. Of course, Doctor Who, you have Atlantis. Did you ever watch Atlantis, by the way, on the BBC? Yes. Okay. I watched till the end. And yeah, that was the show. Did you really like it or? I, I decided I had other things to watch. Oh, so you did not watch it all the way to the end? No. Okay, wise choice. Uh, not saying anything about the actors, it's just how the BBC ran the show. And, of course, Altered Carbon. Have you seen Altered Carbon? No, I keep hearing good things about it, but my Netflix, Hulu, regular list of things is so long. So, so long. I was just looking at it this weekend. Matter of fact, I turned it on to the top of my list, which was The 100, which I haven't gotten through season two yet, and... I, or maybe it's the very beginning of season three. Anyway, I watched like five minutes and I had to go rush off doing something else. So yes, I have a long list on Netflix as well. Carl, if you have the time, Altered Carbon is a fantastic show. And I think season two is coming out really soon. The Last Ship, I'm glad that I watched all the way to the end, but I can't advocate it to anybody that really wants a good show. I mean, there's so much more out there to watch. I, I just got caught in the series and watched it till the end. And uh, yeah, the, the Inhumans. I just want to reiterate, Quentin Peoples is forgiven for the Inhumans. The Inhumans was not Quentin Peoples' fault. Matter of fact, did ABC officially cancel the Inhumans? No, they pretend like it never existed. There's no <laughs> official cancellation notice. It's just one day it was on its website, the other day it wasn't. It's as though they want to gaslight us and say the Inhumans never happened. The Inhumans never happened. Believe us. I wonder if it is actually available somewhere. I just, I, I don't know. Anyway. So we had two episodes of season two. Now I'm officially caught up with Runaways. I've seen everything that Michelle has. Unless, Michelle, have you gotten little snippets of season three? Did they email you DVDs or anything like that? No, I wish they had, but nope. Okay, and actually they would snail mail you DVDs, email you codes, I guess, where you can stream it anyway. I don't know how they do previews anymore. I, I think it's still DVDs or Blu-rays. Anyway, the final two, the penultimate and finale episodes of season two, Earth, Angel, and Split Up. It was still slow in some spots, but of course there was a lot of action between the two. 
How did you feel about the pacing between these two episodes? I thought there was a lot shoved in all of a sudden. Here we are. There's two episodes left of season two, and we're getting the backstory of the aliens and the ship. And we're finding out there's some prophecy, which we don't actually learn what the prophecy says. We just know that the aliens are royal magistrates who are exiled. And then Zavin thinks they're part of the prophecy and they ended up learning how to run the ship. And then there was a crash. And then maybe the prophecy wasn't weird, real, but then there's a woman in light, and I think that's my betrothed, and what? It's just so much in one, like, what? So a couple of things there. First of all, it kind of reminded me a little bit of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where you had that one ship that they filled full of all the useless people, like the lawyers and the, you know, the people that are useless in society, the politicians and stuff, and they sent them off. And they managed to crash land on a planet called Earth. And that's who our um, people that we're descended from come from, at least in the terms of that novelization. So it kind of reminded me a little bit of that because they didn't know how to run the ship or anything. And it was like, and they crash landed on Earth, obviously. So kind of some similarities there. What'd you think about that? I just was, it would have been interesting to have had some sort of intertwine. I mean, Jonah, who's now Victor, saw Zavin and didn't like it. And then there was no other interaction. It's just that Zavin ended up being missing and Victor said, well, that's going to be a problem. Really? Okay. Um, If you say so. It just would have been nice to have had some of that because we just got so much of a lore dump in these last two episodes. And it's just like, that's a lot. It is. The other thing that I want to talk about, about the information dump, is I've been seeing this more and more. We got it in Guardians of the Galaxy 2. We got it a little bit in, what was that, Hercules, I think? The animated version of the Disney Hercules, where they give the history in terms of the animation the quasi animation and stuff so they do bring you up to speed but this is at the end of the second season so this is them saying okay we give up we're not going to tell this story we're just going to give it to you all of a sudden and you're like oh okay but there's holes in it so i don't know if those holes will go away or not it's kind of like the walking dead when they went to the cdc and they try to explain the science behind everything and then they said, oh, that was a big mistake and they will never go back to it. So I don't know what's going to go on in the future, but there's some similarities and not all of them good for how they did it. Harry Potter in the Deathly Hallows, they did it. And that that was a really great way of doing it. The animation style was interesting. It would have, like, I'm not too sure. So Jonas is like the magistrate and it seems as though the one who's now Stacy is the spouse and the one who is Tina is their kid and then they're supposed to be another kid. Yep. And they yep. don't they're like and Tina's like I don't know where my brother is and they're like well we know our son is I guess the rebel of the family, I don't know. Well they know that just jumping ahead uh, uh, we were eventually going to get there but Jumping ahead, we know that they had to inhabit somebody nearby. So it would have to have been somebody that was near the dig site. Could they bring out a bum or something like that that was close by? Of course they could. Darius was nearby. It could have been inhabited by Darius. Uh, But more than likely, all of a sudden, I'm thinking it could be one of the kids. This is the first time that I thought it could be one of the kids. I thought the kids were left alone, but it could be one of the kids. So... The two that have been acting a little odd, one is Nico, but I think that's mostly staff related. And you could make uh, an argument that Nico could be inhabited, especially since Tina, and you don't know if it's Tina, like the regular Tina, or if it's the inhabited Tina, said, oh, I've seen this before. So you, you don't know on Nico, but I would tend to say no. I think that's mostly staff related. The other one would be Alex, and he has been acting way odd 
and I could see him as being inhabited too. So there's two possibilities. Are they the only ones? No, but there are the two immediately when I finished watching going, oh, I could see both of those. Are there any others, Michelle, that you would like to point out? I really think Alex is the most likely candidate if it is one of the kids. We had that moment in one of the last episodes where he was all emotional and he couldn't come up with a plan. Then they tied him up and there was that like little moment. And then all of a sudden he had a plan and he knew what to do. It might be this case where there's not really a huge fight. I'm wondering if the brother is sort of laying low inside Alex, but is still impacting his emotions and maybe feeding him maybe some ideas or something because he is acting a bit more aggressive than usual, but he had, but he's still on, he still has his plan. He still has his focus really out of all of them. It would be that because with Nico, it is the staff. It is such the staff. I'd be good with that explanations right now. And right now we are in full guess mode on what's going to happen with season three, which just comes out in a few months. So we're really ramping up for that. And I'm really excited. I don't have to wait like a whole year or anything for it because I really want to know the answers to some of these. And will that all be answered on the first episode? No, but I'm looking forward to it. So let's back up a second. Let's talk a little bit about the flow of what happened in these two episodes. You had the rescue of Leslie from the Gibb compound, and you had some interesting things happen there, including uh, Carolina meeting her grandmother and Leslie and Carolina escaping. And basically, Carolina could be deemed the Messiah. I mean, she showed her full colors, pun intended, I guess to everybody at the Gibb compound. And so it was brought up by Leslie that she is the Messiah and Caroline is not ready for it, but perception is the rule there. So that's something that happened. Also, Chase became part of, it's hard to say if he's part of pride or if he was just there trying to get intel from his point of view or, or, or whatever. So you had that going on. And then in the final episode, you have the parents finally able to corral their kids and you had all the parents fighting their individual kids, but it's not all the parents because you have some that are inhabited by the royal family, as we pointed out. And that's the, the jux of what happened in those two episodes. Is there anything else important that we should bring out plot wise before we start to have the discussion here? No, I think it'll come up during the discussion. Okay. So... You had all that happen. So that's a lot that happened. Let's start with the Gibb compound because I think that's going to affect something that happens next season. You have Vaughn who gets them close enough to the crater, which Carolina could have as well, but she it's been years since she's been there. So Vaughn is, he's trying to say he's muscular. Is, is Vaughn muscular? Well, he just said he's Vaughn the brawn. And I don't know, maybe in his point of view, he's strong. But when Nico brought out the staff and Bond was like, are you a witch? He fainted. He fainted at the idea of someone next to him being an actual witch. And he went down hard. Uh, that was an interesting flop. That, that was definitely a flop down in the ground. And I'm glad he's not hurt. Maybe he was. I don't know. But it, it looked like. It would have hurt to me. Uh, so then you had an interesting interaction between Frank, Leslie, Carolina, and Susan inside the compound. And I think this is going to, I think a lot of this is going to manifest itself next season because what you have is you have uh, Susan who wants to regain control of the church. You have Leslie who doesn't want anything to do with the church and she's now pregnant and it's, later uh, enunciated by Zavin that it is another crossbreed kid and so she her focus is on that not necessarily on the church and then you had that what did you used to call them uh, michelle i can't remember the sisters you you had a term from them the shining twins the shining twins 
and they weren't in this episode, but they're still involved in the church. So you've got Vaughn, the Shining Sisters, Frank, and Susan, and you might say Leslie's in there as well. I'm not going to, but you got the four of them. I don't know who the sisters are going to align with. If they align with Frank, he's already said he's doesn't believe that Carolina is the true Messiah and everybody has seen that she is the Messiah. So I, I don't know. What do you think? Well, Carolina, she showed all of her callers literally. And later on you, you see she's has the book and she has the picture and it, it is like the angel of light. And that's what she is. She's a being of light. And Leslie's right. She proved everything that David had written about. And by doing so, I mean, they were all, they all bowed. There were plenty of witnesses. You know, even the ones with the guns put down their guns and, and bowed and, and just like, oh, my goodness, I can't believe what I'm seeing. And then all of them immediately turning on Frank when Frank wanted to be like, no, she's lying. This isn't the case. I think Susan has a good chance of reclaiming the church because not only would Carolina support her, but she also does have a good claim of being because she's David's wife is David's wife, Leslie's mother, the Messiah's grandmother. But she was exiled and the shining twins were in on it. So the shining twins and Susan do not have any relationship that's beneficial. Well, she doesn't, well, no, there's actually proof in her file. If you see in her file, she actually has the picture with Leslie and all that type of stuff. It actually proves her identity in her file. Right. That's her identity. But I'm saying the Shining Twins do not, they, they've helped exile her because they wanted her out of the way. So they don't believe that she was to be part of the church. And remember, David, when David, David wanted her out of the way, not the twins, David. Well, the twins were in bed with David. Susan. Yeah, but later on, that's later on. Leslie was already. Yeah. Okay. So you have to understand, you saw in the flashback, it was Susan and David were together. David was spouting all of his stuff. And then, yes, you know, they met, he met Jonah. So, yes, Susan was still there. But it really was between those two. The twins might have just like obeyed David and David said one thing, but it wasn't just, it wasn't them. It was them following David. They're not, you have to understand they're followers. The shining twins are followers. They followed David. They followed Jonah. They're followers. So once they learn of what, Carolina did, they're going to follow because that's what they do. I think they could still follow Frank. I think they could still help Frank out. Not with the entire crater and all those people with those guns locking him up because that was like a big part of their forces. I don't know how many ultras there are in the church. That could be a, a, a mitigating factor of, of the church governance post Jonah here and what influence the Shining Twins have on it. I don't, this is all to be discovered in season three. You know, this is just us pontificating at this point. We have no idea, but it's an interesting thing to walk through is what's going to happen because I don't think Frank's going to stay in jail. I think he's going to get out somehow and I don't know how that's going to happen. So it's going to be an interesting, see, this is just the beginning of the interesting season three. The Church of Gift, and I also want to bring up, at the very end, you have Chase and Janet and uh, Carolina. They're all captured in their stasis pods in Victor's home workshop. And he wants to feed on one of them to, you know, get his energy back up and stop flanking. Since Carolina is there, and since she is labeled as the Messiah, I see the possibility of the Church of Gib teaming up with the runaways, the parents, maybe all three, of 
actually rescuing Carolina from the stasis pot. That's a good possibility because Leslie is still out there and Zavin is on her side. And of course, once it's also, they're going to be after Leslie because apparently she, her child is more like the Haven. Of course, there is a possibility of the brother being the baby. Oh. Huh. That would be interesting. Because Leslie really thought it was Frank's. That was what's interesting. She really actually thought the baby was Frank's. When they had, when they got together, back together in season one, where they had that nice little moment and it seems as though they reconnected. Because if you see her reaction, she really thought it was Frank's. That would be interesting. I just thought of that. It would explain why he's not on the board now. And it would still justify Alex's and Nico's and everybody else's actions to date because they're in character. I, we were just pointing out before that Alex might be just the, a little off. And I was pointing out Nico could have been too. But yeah, I could see that where very interesting. Huh. Zavin is interesting because she or he, I, I'm going to take a stab and say it's a she. She has no concept of humanity. Yeah, but she's a shapeshifter who doesn't have, who wasn't used to a mouth and everything. I, I call it them because I'm not really too sure when you're a shapeshifter, you can be anything sure i'll go with it they need to learn not to pose as people who are already there like she posed like they posed as gert they posed as nico carolina yeah it's like don't do that lesson one don't do that lesson two donuts and ketchup was it ketchup i thought it was jelly no it was ketchup oh because it was squeezed out yeah, they, there's some jelly that's squeezed out like that, though, but it, it more clumps out. You're right. Uh, I thought it was jelly. I, I was going with jelly filled. Now you've, ugh. ugh. Mm. Uh, but at least she's fitting in with most of America. High fructose corn syrup. Yay. The bane of most Americans' diets. So you wanted to talk about, let, let's jump ahead to all the fights. So you had the kids fighting with their parents at the end, which was really interesting uh, to see who won. Now, I was going into this second half of the final episode going, oh, they're all going to lose. And I don't know where they're going to go. I was a little bit disheartened. I was like, I don't want to watch them all lose. But some of them won. So that's pretty cool. Alex was one of them. So he's being chased. First of all. They have this grand plan. The parents have this grand plan to use drone fleet to go after everybody and shoot them full of darts and have weapons to mitigate uh, what's going on with each of them. You had uh, the light prison for Carolina. You had the mind scrambler for Nico. So they had some interesting weapons. We knew some of them, but we didn't know all of them. So the kids decided to split up because it was their best defense against everything. They did, and they thought some of them would escape. Some of them did. Alex. His fight with his parents was really cool. It was all premeditated. He knew it was going to come to this. Well, how'd you like that? My favorite part was when it turned into a car chase and his father was just, I never should have let him play Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> My daughter plays Grand Theft Auto and I worry about her sometimes. And they told Tina to call off the drone. And first, you think that Alex is going to shoot them. Instead, he does fire the gun. But what he does is he actually calls the police. And because there's no more Flores and there's no more AWOL, actual police show up. And he plants the gun in their car. And they're actually getting arrested now, whether or not the charges stick or whatever, but they're actually going to be getting arrested. They're going to be getting into the system. They're going to be getting questioned. It was a really good plan. Finally, one of Alex's plans worked out. 
they did. And I'm just, again, thinking in terms of the third season going, where are we going to go from here? So we have the whole Tamar relationship going on, and she had teamed up with AWOL. AWOL is out of the picture, at least for now. I think AWOL will come back. I don't think he's disappeared for good, although that could be what happened. And Tamar could, she's got some street cred. She's got Darius's gang behind her. She could negotiate with the Wilders here. I think we're going to see a little bit of that going forward in season three. I don't know who's going to end up on top. I don't know if it will be continual battle between the two families but i don't see them spending all their time in jail i think they're going to get out it'd be interesting what the price is yes i think the price is going to be high and i'm going to think that the wilders they don't think that they have any options so they're going to go ahead and they're going to pay whatever price it is so yeah it'll be interesting and also, it'll be interesting who Tamar deals with because Jeffrey held to his bargain and he gave the property over to Tamar that he was going to give to Darius. So he followed through. I think she's going to deal with him and she's not going to want to deal with her. That's, that's just a thought. Maybe she'll talk to all of them. I don't know. I know it's going to be interesting. Like, what, what will happen to their assets? Because a lot of times in these sort of cases, sometimes assets are frozen. Will Alex have any way to support himself? I mean, he's still, he's one of the ones that makes it. He's still a runaway and it's been rough for them. Finding food and being able to do what they need to do. I don't know. I tend to think that Alex is going to find himself back at home. But the hostel, as they're calling it, that's kind of their home. So I, I don't know if interesting because their Wilder's house has that basement. Interesting. I don't know. We'll we'll see what happens in the future. Maybe they'll get by without it. I don't know. Maybe they'll give the house to Tamar and frame her for all the deaths. I don't know. We'll see. There's a lot to be done with that in the future. Also. You had probably the most interesting fight, in my opinion, was Nico and her parents. I really enjoyed that. Nico figures out that her mom's the one who's behind the drones, and she's like, enough. And she goes to the main office, and they have the word scrambler. Well, her, her brain scrambler, which makes her say the words odd. Which that was kind of funny, frustrating. I can understand her frustration, but in a way, kind of funny because she's trying to tell Carolina that I love you. And yeah, you can almost every time she speaks, you can almost understand what she's trying to say. But sometimes it's just like I don't know what you're trying to say. It's not like R two D two when he whistles, you're like, oh, I know what R two D two is saying. In this case, sometimes you could, and sometimes it's like eh, I don't know. And she starts to you know, want to destroy and she's, you know, she can't actually do a spell because of the scrambler thing. And so she starts to use the staff as an actual weapon. And that's when we find out that not only mom, but dad are like Kung Fu masters. They're martial arts experts. And it's, it's quite the fight. Nico was holding her own against her parents for a while until uh, Tina gets in that really good roundhouse kick, which knocks Nico out again. And then Nico's eyes go purple, does the thing, and that energy comes off the staff and she blows out the glass. She might have killed Robert. Robert might actually be dead this time. I'll, uh, I'll agree with that. Robert could be dead this time. Although she did say. Later, Tina did say, or the alien said she was dealing with a medical emergency, but there was no indication that Robert was dead, but it's an alien. So but what would she care either way? So yeah, that could, could be. And I thought it was interesting that she said smash because that's a Hulk saying, right? Hulk smash. So I, obviously she's not going to be Hulk or she Hulk, but that was just interesting. A Hulk reference. 
And it's something about, you know, when she's tending to Robert, she says, I've seen this before with the staff. And she tells Robert, there are things I haven't told you about the staff. And that was a whole, like, well, it would have been interesting to have gotten some of that throughout the season, learn about more about the staff, learn more about, because we had time. We've been able to cover two episodes a week for a reason. Because a lot of it just wasn't really densely packed. And it was just really cool. What is the staff? Where did it come from? I'm wondering if the moment with Robert and Robert possibly dying is when the alien was able to take over Tina because she said she had a really tough time because Tina's a control freak. Yeah, and especially since it was a daughter, it wasn't a grown-up, so she could be inexperienced in the matters. And I don't know if the parents would, I guess Jonah would be experienced, but the magistrate, but his wife, I don't know. And they didn't know where each other were until they actually met each other. So, I don't know. Again, lots to cover in season three. We might get some more history of the staff. We might not because Tina is inhabited by the alien and... There are ways to kill Jonah, as Zavin pointed out, but it's more difficult. I don't know if that means that the host has to die or not. We're getting at the point in the series where there should be some consequences, and you could see some of the main cast start to be killed off in season three. I, I could see that. We had a little bit more interesting dealings. We had Stacy and Dale going after Molly and Gert. Molly actually ends up getting away, which is pretty cool, I think. Uh, she, Molly did attribute it, her being strong to be having a strong older sister. So I thought that was really neat in the heat of the moment conversation between the sisters, really bonding as sisters again, and Molly really giving Gert her due diligence. But then Gert gets hit on the head by Stacy, which I think was the alien at the time. And then we don't see what exactly happens. We see the aftermath. Dale kidnaps Gert and Old Lace and is driving out of town, probably to go to their land that they referenced before uh, without Stacy because Stacy has been acting extra murderous -y. Yeah, if you notice in the scene, again, it's a very intense emotional moment where Gert seems to like when and then the alien takes over and just smashes it would have been interesting to see dale somehow outsmart alien stacy we have to we have to leave a lot to the imagination because you know gert was right there and conscious stacy was right there and then dale comes in so how was dale able to convince alien stacy to just go somewhere and then be able to take Gert and old lace. And I loved, I loved it when Gert, you know, realizes, and she's like, wait a minute, my murderous dad is taking me away from my more murderous mom. And he's just like, basically, but I got this cool CD. Oh my God. And she's in the back, you know, the, the loudest speakers are in the back and she's stuck in the back there. And I, I feel for her in the dog cage. That's a dog cage, by the way, in the back or a dog gate that's in the back of the SUV. I've seen them before. I haven't used one personally because I usually travel with a kennel if I'm traveling with a little puppy, but I know what they're for. You see them in canine units. You see them with people that have hunting dogs and stuff like that. So that's what it is. So she's in a cage in the back of the SUV. And not all SUVs have the kidnapping lever on the trunk. A lot of all cars do. There's some sort of lever nowadays where you can pull, but SUVs are not the same way. So she is stuck back there, unfortunately. And they're going to go off. I think somebody's going to get in touch with Dale because, well, you saw on the dashboard, you had a whizzy camera on the dashboard. Did you see that? Yes. He can be found. Yeah. He's not as cute as he thinks he is but stacy did say when she went to the stein's house later she did say i had to let dale take gert basically 
So Stacy let Dale go. I don't think there was Dale wasn't outsmarting Stacy in this case. It would have been nice to have seen something because again, we didn't see what happened to Robert. Again, we didn't see what happened between Stacy and Dale because because we saw what happened between Janet, Victor, and Chase. We saw a lot more of that because we followed Victor's time loss. And that's how, you know, Chase came and then Chase ended up mentioning to Janet about the skin. And that's when Janet realized, you know, how come they weren't able to get away, but like the others were. So one thing I will say is that Robert, and we kind of dismissed it at the time, and I said it might come back later, and it still might, it might not, but Robert was the one who created the technology which kind of held Jonah, and it was very painful to Jonah. If Robert kept those schematics somewhere, at least they have that, that they combat Jonah, Victor, the aliens that are inhabiting the other parents right now. That could be a step which they could take. I don't know what's going to happen in season three. I know that something's got to be done soon. Otherwise, one of them are going to die. I would hate for it to be any one of those three, Chase, Janet, or Carolina, but I don't know. It, it could happen. And that's the other thing is that Janet, as I mentioned before, I'm glad she finally figured out that Victor was Jonah. I mean, she made not only the leap that Victor was an alien, but Victor was Jonah based on what was being told to her. And Chase and Janet tried to stop him. They didn't know that he had a special suit on. So they, their plan failed. And now they're stuck. I wonder if they're all stuck in the same dream or if they're in three separate dreams. That would be interesting to learn. I just thought of that. That would because Janet was able to manipulate it without Jonah knowing. Of course, Victor knew, but it seems as though once they take over, a lot of the information, it's not like they're getting information from the host. It seems like. Yeah. It'll be fun figuring that out. And one last thing with Chase. He was drawing on his tablet, and it wasn't a comic. It was an actual design. It was some, a vehicle called the Leapfrog, which is a legitimate. I'd have to defer to Lauren on exactly what's going on with the Leapfrog. But from what I saw, the Leapfrog was like half vehicle, half mech. And that is a thing in the Runaways. So we might get it later on in season three or season four. Looking forward to that. Or maybe it was just a nice homage to the comics. I don't know. I have got a question for you. Now, Jonah said that he wanted to remain in Jonah's body in order to maintain the connection with his daughter. And he said as soon as he would move on to another host, that connection would be gone. Since he kidnapped, imprisoned his own daughter and is ready to feed on her, is that relationship, that love, that feeling that Jonah had for Caroline, is that gone now? It almost seems like it is. I think it is. I mean, he knows that Carolina is his half daughter or his daughter is half human, uh, but it doesn't matter to him. I wonder if he can actually feed on her the same way. I guess it's just a, a, a energy transferring from being to being. So might get a bigger boost from her. I don't know. I don't think we're going to find that out. All right. With all that said, I got to the end of season two. I'm like, okay, well, this was fun watch to get to here. I probably would have preferred to just binge watch it one weekend when it was, you know, bad weather outside or something like that. But I think it was fun. Did you have fun watching it, Michelle? Of course. I enjoy the show. And I can't wait to rewatch Cloak and Dagger. Which we're going to do next time, right? We're going to go over Cloak and Dagger, season one, episode one, and season one, episode two, which are First Light and Suicide Sprints. It is available on Hulu. Hulu. So you got to have Hulu in order to get this. I might buy the season on Vudu or Prime or wherever I can find it, but 
We'll see. I don't know if it's available anywhere else. I just know it's on Hulu and that's how I'll be watching it. Okay. Well, I'll look into it and we'll see where I can dig it up. Eventually, Disney Plus is going to have that package deal with Hulu, which I might do. So I we'll see. We'll see what happens there. Anyway, hopefully we'll have Lauren and Haley back next week and we'll discuss anything that they want to discuss about the end of Runaways and then go into Cloak and Dagger. And listener, if you have anything you want to say about the Runaways so far or your predictions for season three, please let us know. You can email me, StargatePioneer at GunnaGeek.com or catch us at all the other ways that we said at the top of the show. In the meantime, there's an important news item which we just have to go over this week. There was one news item this week that we wanted to make sure that we touched upon. Actually, in all fairness, Michelle wanted to wait a week, but I'm like, I don't know what else is going to come out in the next week. So I want to have my say now before Mark comes out. So basically, Variety.com and a bunch of other news outlets reported that Sony and Marvel slash Disney got back together again. Right, Michelle? Yeah, I wonder if. Sony heard all of the backlash and how everybody was on Marvel's side and not their side and went, well, I guess we do need to finish out this whole Marvel arc and it would be very difficult to do a Spider-Man 3 considering all the Marvel stuff in it. So they're getting back together for one movie at least. And it looks like Spider-Man Tom Holland will appear in one regular Marvel movie. But after that and is sketchy. So I completely agree with you. I think what happened is Sony thought they had a little bit more leverage than they really did. And they heard the reaction from the fans. And, and they, they remember, they tried to fight for a couple of days. They went back and forth and there was a little bit of finger pointing. And Sony really just did not come out on top. I think they might have thought that at the end of the Infinity Saga, that more people would have said, hey, look, Marvel's getting too big. We need a little diversity here. And there's something to be said about that. But honestly, when you have one of the key characters in the MCU, in Tom Holland as Spider-Man, and then just to say, no, we're not going to play by your rules. You need us more than we need you. That just wasn't the case. And they went back to their normal deal. And I think they went back to the normal deal largely because both of them realized that they had to end it differently than it ended right now. Because if it ended right now in Far From Home, that was a terrible ending into the MCU. You've introduced Tom Holland as Spider Man as the Tony Stark heir. And then he is now outed. You know, you had those two things at the end of Far From Home, and then you just drop them from the MCU. That wasn't really going to work. So they need some sort of transition. I think the two movies that they have, one Spider-Man movie and then the MCU joint movie, I think that's enough. I don't know what's going to happen beyond that. Michelle, you pointed that out before we started recording, is that they might actually make another deal, and there might be more Tom Holland in the MCU. But I'm thinking if I'm Marvel, I'm planning on it being a stopping point with Tom Holland and that they can move on. And there's a couple of interesting things, a couple of interesting characters that they can move on to that are heir apparents to the Tony Stark role. Aren't there, Michelle? You came up with one in our Discord server. I'm like, well, if you're going to go with the techie genius teenage route, Shuri from Black Panther. I mean, why not? Yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, the Iron Heart character in the Marvel's uh, comics is kind of the same sort of character. So one could argue Shuri, who's a character on her own in the comics, her role is very much like Ironheart in the comics. And that that is a direct heir apparent of Iron Man. So there's no big deal there. I mean, Shuri's a genius on her own. That could happen. I want to throw out one more. I know he's not part of the MCU right now. I know his character is flawed, but you never know how Marvel is going to 
uh, reboot the character as they integrate it in back into the MCU is Reed Richards. He obviously could be a Tony Stark replacement. And there's also the obvious, you know, War Machine, his bestie. He's never really, he, he's more of a military guy. He wasn't necessarily the tech provider. I don't think he could science bro it with the Hulk. Well, then give it to the Hulk. Yeah. There are so many other characters that are possible that they really didn't have to. I think that's what Sony, I think that's what Sony thought they had. I think Sony was like, oh, they've made Spider-Man the heir apparent to Tony Stark. They, they have to have us. They have to because of what they did. And Marvel's like, you know, we just bought Fox. We have all these mutants. We have the Fantastic Four. We can just have something off screen and mention this spider person kind of and do something else. And I think that's when Sony was just like, oh, you have other ideas? Yes, we have a whole bunch of other characters. Oh, uh, okay. And I just want to throw this in there too. Before this announcement came out, also Kevin Feige was announced that he was taking over a Star Wars film. There's no indication that he is swapping over from the MCU to Star Wars to take over that branch of Disney. But just the fact that, oh, we have other things that we can do with Kevin Feige outside of the MCU rather than Spider-Man. Yeah, I think you guys have overestimated what you can do with your spider IP in relation to the MCU. I mean, I know... I. I've looked at a list of all the future Sony spider movies that they had planned coming out. There's a lot of them, but I just don't think they're going to have the same gravitas without being connected to the MCU. And I just, I don't think Sony really gets that right now. What made the MCU great was it was the MCU. And if you're not a part of the MCU, people are like, eh, it's, it's not going to be that must see movie. I, a matter of fact, that's what I was thinking of all the Spider-Man movies coming out. I wasn't going to see it in the theater. I saw that. Far from home in the theater because it was part of the MCU, but I didn't see Into the Spider Verse in the theater. Probably a mistake, but I didn't, and I didn't see Venom in the theater. I wasn't planning on seeing any of the other Spider Man movies or Spider IP movies in the theater because they're not part of the MCU. Anyway, it's my two cents on it. I think that there are other places to go than Spider Man for that role. Uh, Forge, that's another great example. Who's a mutant, right? Forge, he could take that role too. There's lots of roles or characters out there that can take the role. Anyway, Michelle, do you think this was a smart move on both the Disney and Sony side? Look, all Disney had to do would be like, I wonder if there was an office pool, like somewhere there has to be a whiteboard, you know? Everybody bets like a dollar or five dollars or whatever. And it's like, we just got to sit back. When, when will Sony come crawling back to us? How long? Who's got two weeks? Who's got two months? Who's got, you know, I just, I just really think somebody's like, I had 15 days. I got this. Somebody won a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. Someone won. Oh, oh, it's, they're rich people. They're probably just bet a dollar, like how it's funny in trading spaces. Right. Anyway, I'm sure there will be more that comes out on this in the next week. We'll probably talk about it next week with Lauren and Haley. But I, me personally, I wanted to get my two cents out there this week before things change. Because, yeah, it was stupid for Sony to think that they had more of a bargaining chip than they did. In my opinion. Sony, don't sue me. Anyway, with that. That's it for the week, Michelle. Are you ready to hitch up our horse trailer and get out of here? I am. It was fun going through the runaways with all three of you and all of our listeners. And I look forward to going through Cloak and Dagger. We're going to start it right now. And I know we have listeners that like Cloak and Dagger. So let us know what you think about the first two episodes. And thank you very much for staying with us in this off season and in this final off season 
or Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Yeah, we appreciate everyone who interacts with us on Discord, on Twitter. Again, we just appreciate you. Thank you for listening and thank you for sticking with us. All right. Until next time or Agents of Sword or whatever gets announced in the future after Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I'm Director SP. And I'm Agent Michelle. We'll see you guys next week. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening. If you want to leave us feedback, go to gunageek.com and you will find all our contact information and other shows. You can also visit legendsofshield.com where you'll find our complete archive of podcasts. The music heard on this podcast is by Kevin McLeod, found at incompetech.com and also artists on pond5.com and audiojungle.net. The opinions heard on this podcast are those of the individual hosts and do not represent Stargate Pioneer Productions, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., or Gunna Geek. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is the property of the Disney Corporation, Marvel Studios, and ABC. No infringement is intended. Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is copyright 2013 through 2019.